two planes that stand out in the history of flight that shared a number of similarities. Both had a striking appearance. Both had a throaty roar from inline 12-cylinder motors. Both, rightly or wrongly, were credited for winning World War II. Two of the most popular warbirds from World War II are the Spitfire and the Mustang. It's possible that their styling is what appeals. Maybe it's the throaty roar of the inline 12-cylinder Merlin Rolls-Royce supercharged engines that both planes used that invokes awe. Perhaps it's the combination of styling and sound that make these planes a favorite at air shows. Although both planes share similar styling, power plants and roles in battle, and both were designated as fighter bombers, that is where the similarity ends. The Mustang had similar statistics as the Spitfire. A little over 15,000 P-51 Mustangs were produced during World War II. The English version had four 20mm cannons and six machine guns. The Packard Rolls-Royce Merlin V1650 engine was equipped with water injection and provided more than 2,000 horsepower in a wartime emergency. The main difference was the ability of the Mustang to fly long distances, and that's where the Mustang shone, as a long-distance fighter bomber. The undercarriage on the Mustang was wider and helped with landing the plane in more remote and rugged airfields. Although other planes were built that were better performers than the Spitfire and Mustang, these were generally radial engine machines. The Spitfire and Mustang represent the pinnacle of the inline engine during their time. Both planes had great attributes. Both also had their vices, but overall, these planes were outstanding machines and have gone on to be the symbol of an era of flight. Although the Mustang was an excellent plane, one of the flaws pilots harshly complained about was the severe lack of rear visibility. The original standard canopy was indeed poorly designed. In combat, the pilot who sighted the adversary first had a very clear advantage. Unfortunately, the pilot of a P-51 often didn't see or know of a rear attack until bullets struck his plane. To rectify this, a bubble canopy was designed and retrofitted to earlier Mustangs. This was an interim solution. Later versions of the Mustang had a totally revised canopy and had the rear fuselage cut down. These two revisions provide excellent all-round visibility. This P-51D model illustrates the changes. The Mustang was designed and built by a company called North American. The workshops were, for the time, state-of-the-art, and the output of this company, in terms of quality and quantity, was extraordinary. The prototype was concepted and constructed in 122 days. North America was a model of technology and technique. 
the efficiency of the company enabled them to build 9,000 Mustangs in a year. North America went on to produce more planes during World War II than any other American aviation company. This was a remarkable feat, as the P-51 Mustang was the first combat aircraft that North America had created from the ground up. The final armament configuration was six-wing mounted machine guns and a capacity to carry two 500-pound bombs. However, it was the power plant that required several changes before the Mustang reached its potential. The early Mustangs suffered a catch-22 predicament regarding engines. The first engine used was a non-supercharged Allison. This engine was great for low-level work, such as battlefield cover, reconnaissance and dive bombing. However, an inline engine is vulnerable in such conditions. The radiator and oil cooling apparatus is easily damaged by even small calibre fire, and radial engine planes were seen as more suited to these types of operations. The Allison wouldn't allow the Mustang to be useful above 12,000 feet altitude, so the Mustang was a great plane that had great limitations. The problem was solved when the supercharged Merlin was fitted. With the Merlin, the P-51 saw its potential as a fighter. Interestingly, a dive bomber variant, the A-36A, with dive brake was developed. Flyers of the A-36A are credited with perfecting a technique called skip bombing. It's widely argued that the motor is what allowed the Mustang to take its place as one of the finest fighters of World War II, and that the Merlin engine in particular is what allowed the Mustang to reach its potential. But the plane as a package was great from day one, and the refinement of the craft didn't focus on the motor. The whole plane, including its airframe, propeller and armament, was constantly refined. However, it would be the D version of the Mustang, with its prominent underbelly air dam, refined fuselage and bubble type canopy, that's the typical Mustang. Even though further variants were later developed, few were actually used in great numbers. The first Mustangs with the Allison engine have been described by pilots as a joy to fly and phrases like velvet smooth and a most forgiving aircraft have been used to portray the flying of this most remarkable plane. But all the modifications changed the character of the Mustang. It became noisier, skittish and demanded more input from the pilot. But its performance was outstanding to the point that at its high it was undoubtedly the plane of choice. The production of one of the world's finest aircraft came about in an interesting way. During 1939, the British approached the Americans. They needed a fighter plane. They'd already approached Curtis, but they couldn't deliver, as they were in full production with the P-40. The British wanted North American to build P-40s under license. Dutch Kindleberger, the CEO North American, suggested they could build a new improved craft using the Allison power plant from the P-40. Overnight, Kindleberger's design team came up with a sleek new fighter plan, and the British gave the go-ahead to proceed with 320 of the new P-51s. The contract required the prototype to be ready within eight months. North American decided to try for 120 days. North American was two days late on their estimate of 120 days because the engines were two days late getting to the North American factory. What's most remarkable about this achievement is that the prototype P-51 was built in the same time that it would take for North American to tool up to construct the P-40. The British had previously dealt with North American 
as they'd supplied them with 86 Harvard trainers. North American had proved their reliability and product quality. Even though North American had never built an actual warbird, the British were convinced that North American aviation would deliver. The Harvard, which is also known as the AT-6 Texan, was a twin-seat low-wing trainer. It continued in service for a long time after the war. The British Commonwealth Air Training Plan used the Harvard extensively for intermediate training from 1940 onwards. The total production of the trainer was an incredible 21,342 units. Today, the Harvard trainer is still a sought-after commodity with restorers and World War II warbird enthusiasts. Here are a couple of 86s going through their paces in a pylon racing event that was recently held in Tasmania, Australia. It was powered by a Pratt & Whitney engine that could achieve a top speed of 208 miles per hour with a ceiling of 24,280 feet and it could be armed with 2.5 inch machine guns for target practice. Again, the Spitfire and the Mustang share a similarity. The wing design of the Spitfire was a breakthrough at the time, and this gave the plane its impeccable handling capabilities. The Mustang's designers improved upon that with the first laminar flow wing, which shifted the thickest part of the wing rearward. This reduced drag and greatly reduced fuel consumption. The incredibly low fuel consumption gave the Mustang the title of the best long-range fighter bomber of World War II. With a 425-gallon fuel tank capacity and an engine that used about 50% less fuel than other fighters, the P-51B had a range of 1,080 miles. With drop tanks attached, this range increased to 2,600 miles. Probably for the first time, the Allies had planes capable of protecting bombers on long-range missions. The Mustang's ability to protect the bombers had a large effect on the efficiency of the raids, as the bomber crews had more security and were freer to concentrate on the targets. Goering stated that when he looked in the sky and saw Allied fighters shepherding the bombers, he knew that Germany had lost the war. The fighters were P-51 Mustangs. No longer could the Luftwaffe fighters enjoy turkey shoots of Allied bombers. From this point on, the German fighter aircraft were on the defensive. In addition to protecting the bombers at high altitudes, the P-51 Mustangs were given the added assignment of destroying the Luftwaffe aircraft on the ground along with their support facilities during low-altitude strafing missions. The Mustang's military record is outstanding. Mustangs destroyed 4,950 enemy aircraft in air combat and 4,131 on the ground. During the Second World War, the Mustang flew 213,873 missions in Europe alone. The planes shot down by the Mustang add up to almost half that claim by the combined American units in the European theater. A total of 2,520 Mustangs were lost.
Like all great technological breakthroughs, they are soon improved upon. And the Mustang's day, and to a certain degree, the day of propeller-driven fighter planes, drew to a close on July 8, 1942, when the ME-262 took off under the power of two turbojets. The design of the ME-262 jet fighter began about a year before the outbreak of World War II. However, delays in the development of the jet engine meant it would be six years before the aircraft finally entered service. When the ME-262s finally took to the sky, they proved to have outstanding flying qualities. Although more than 500 ME-262s had been produced by December 1944, by the end of the war, the total number of Finnish craft was about 1,430. Probably less than 25% of these saw frontline service. However, losses of ME-262s were relatively heavy. A large number of these losses were due to mechanical failures and inexperienced pilots. The ME-262s did achieve a better than one-for-one one loss and JV-44, the top-scoring ME-262 interceptor unit, achieved more than 50 kills in just over a month of operation. In air-to-air -air combat, the ME-262 never engaged its British counterpart, the twin-jet Gloucester Meteor. But surprisingly, many ME-262s were destroyed by Allied Mustang, Spitfire, Tempest and Thunderbolt piston-engine fighters. At the end of the war, and even though jets were being developed, the Mustang didn't just fade from view. It went on to serve in many other wars and other countries. It took some time before the jet aircraft was developed to a point that they were suitable for total combat conditions and the infrastructure for maintaining them was in place. The Mustang filled the role of a stopgap. The Mustang fought in Korea during the early 50s and in many other smaller conflicts. In Korea, they flew more combat missions than any other type of military aircraft. The P-51 was used because it was available in large numbers and still the only aircraft that had the long range required and the ability to carry a payload with impact. Amazingly, the Mustang served about 25 different countries and operated for more than 35 years. It flew its last combat missions during the 1956 Desert War, and the Dominican Republic used the P-51. 44 of these were taken on in 1948, and some remained in service as late as 1984. The P-51's acceptance was incredible. Even the Soviet Union operated a few Mustangs. The U.S. sent China 50 P-51s before the end of World War II, and they remained in service until the mid-1950s. Canadians had the craft in service until 1956. Many of these returned to the U.S. civilian market. A remarkable story is the New Zealand order for 320 P-51s just before the end of World War II. Only 30 of the order were received in 1945. They were left in their packing cases until 1950. They eventually got assembled, but by 1955, they were sold for scrap. Sweden was one of the biggest overseas users of the Mustang. Sweden sold their Mustangs to Israel and Latin American countries. Switzerland had 100 P-51s in 1948, and they stayed in service until 1956. Italy used 48 Mustangs between 1948 and 53. South Africa flew 95 Mustangs in Korea and the Philippines used the P-51 Mustang during the post-war era and then took them out of service in the mid-50s. Even Cuba had a couple of Mustangs. Today, the P-51, in a way, is still in service. A good number of them have been restored and put back into flying condition. Their new role is demonstrating the era of World War II aircraft to thousands of people at air shows around the world.
Although it can be argued that other planes deserve the title of the best fighter of World War II, it's interesting to note that the Spitfire and the Mustang made such an impact and developed such a following that a few companies have evolved that specialize in manufacturing two-thirds or three-quarter size flying replicas of the planes. Companies duplicate the aircraft in the closest possible way to ensure the plane flies and feels like the original. This is Jimmy Wickham of Australia putting his Chevy powered Mustang through its paces at a recent air show. Different manufacturers use different power plants. What is interesting is that in certain areas, the replicas actually outperform the original. For example, the Thunder Mustang has a cruising speed of 40 miles per hour more than the original and has nearly twice the rate of climb as the original. It is a high performing uh, as you can hear on this Join us again on our next search through our brief but fascinating history of flight and aviation. Come with us and meet the people, the planes and the companies that have created the world's most technologically advanced machines.